So when you think about these words, historic and weaving, many of you are going to have a preconceived idea of what that means. Oh, man, I'm going to put you on hold a minute. Yes. We forgot to give you the microphone. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's do that. I, I realize that. People want to hear me is what I'm hearing. We want to hear you. <laughs> and I also want to hear you on YouTube. It's a different At the real end. Does that sound better, everybody? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. A little bit better? Live? All right. Let's start over again. <laughs> Hi! <laughs> I am the historic weaver behind Historic Weaving. This name of my business, Historic Weaving, and you might have an idea that there's a preconceived notion of what really drives me. But actually, it is a love of history, and it is a love of weaving. So I like my fiber but I also like the stories. And today, I'm here to present the stories and the research that I've been doing about Mary Meg's Atwater. And it's really great to be doing this in Butte because much of the story of Mary Meg's Atwater really starts here in Butte and people aren't aware of it. The state of Montana has no signage, no acknowledgement of the contributions of this particular person. So I'm gonna, pull you through her story in a different context. Those of you that are weavers, you've heard about Mary Meg's Atwater in the context of what do we do with fiber, which is called weaving. I want to show you a larger story about Mary and how important I think she is to the entire world. I admire Mary Meg Atwater's spirit and her character, and I believe that she deserves recognition for her contributions to improve the community of mining camps where she lived most of her life. Portions of this presentation are going to be narrated in the first person, using Mary's own words to describe her impressions of the situation in which she found herself. The source of the narration is a book called Weaving a Life, the Story of Mary Meg Atwater. These words have been taken from Mary's memoirs. By the second, the little arrow. I did. Oh. I don't know what it's doing to me. It was working. Did we accidentally turn it off? I don't know. Let's see. I tried it when I first got here. Of course we did. <laughs> February 28, 1878, in Rock Island, Illinois. She attended the Chicago Art Institute School of Design in 1897. She married Maxwell Wantum Atwater in 1905, moved to Butte, Montana in 1909, moved to Basin, Montana in 1914, started a weaving business in Basin, Montana in 1916, sold that weaving business in Basin, Montana in 1946. She died September the 5th, 1956, at the age of 78 in Salt Lake City. Mary Meg Sowater is often called the Dean of American Hand Weaving. And the title of Dean gives you the impression that there was something academic going on in her life. The question I've got is, how is it possible to earn the title of dean when you're not associated with a particular university or office by contributing heavily in her field of study over the course of a lifetime? 
her achievements. She started a mail order weaving business to improve the lives of Montana miners' wives. She used this business to promote distance weaving education and to support her children after she was widowed. She used her unique position to travel throughout the world capturing and recording for future generations patterns and techniques of hand weaving. She established a national weaving guild and a system of conferences to promote the education of weavers in the United States. She was a veteran of the First World War. An occupational therapist was her role. She taught weaving to soldiers in hospitals as they recovered from their injuries. Mary Mays Atwater did teach at several universities in her career, but never served in an administrative role. For those that aren't fibrous, I digress for a moment. I must introduce what weaving is. There are four basic ways of making cloth and textiles today, and we started first with fur. This is fake, by the way. We then moved on to something we call felting, and its manner of being assembled is that you would take the fluffy wool from the sheep, process it, clean it, put some water and soap on it, and you would use friction, and the hooks would put this together, and it becomes a flat piece, much like paper, only it's much stronger than paper. Then we evolved in the world of textile making to understanding that a tool called a hook could be used if I spun a string and I used loops, I could make mm, clothing. <laughs> this is called crochet. And then the further development was I had one hook and then I could get myself to the point that I could use, ooh, long, sharp, pointy sticks. These are called knitting needles. But there are people who would also be able to take many of these crochet hook looking devices together, put them in a machine, and also be called knitting. It's knitting because you're using more than one hook, and you are holding onto the stitches in between the, each time you've processed it. In a crochet, you can only hold onto the stitches that fit on the hook, usually one or two at a time. This is much more. By the way, this is from my daughter. <laughs> so I can do these things. I started just like you guys. Mm -hmm. um, so when you get to weaving, weaving requires one more thing than these items do. It requires something to keep it under tension. And that object to keep it under tension, whether it could start out as simple as a piece of cardboard, it could be a picture frame, or this item here, which we call a loom. When it keeps it under tension, I have a warp that'll go along this, that's the threads that go from front to back, and when I pass the thread from left to right or east to west, this is my weft. The unique thing about weaving is the intersection is always perpendicular, always. When you're dealing with knitting and crocheting, you're always dealing with the loop big difference in how the fibers are constructed. Hand weaving, when we said Mary was the dean of hand weaving, hand weaving in the United States is largely the province of the hobbyist and the independent professional weaver. In early American history, the path to independence included the need for textile production. Farmers raised sheep, flax and cotton, Rules were in place for raw material to be harvested in the colonies, but shipped to Europe for processing. The colonies were then forced to purchase the finished, finished goods from the mother country, and of course in that purchase there was taxation. So in the early years of statehood, it was determined that it was necessary for the United States to produce its own textiles. There were efforts at equipping both professional weavers and the weaver who would produce locally for the family on the home and the farm. It was possible at that point in time to pay taxes by spinning wool and producing woolen cloth. People don't know that the real reason a spinster is a good word in our world is 30 pounds of wool a year would pay the taxes for the farm. So you needed a person dedicated to spinning, hence the word spinster. During Mary's lifetime and during the time that we're talking about, I want to talk a little bit more about the industrialization of textile processing. The ability to use water power 
to spin had been known since 1732. Spinning had been mechanized in 1764 with the multiple spinning jetty. A mechanized power loom appeared in 1786, the invention of Mr. Cartwright, but the first mechanized loom in the United States did not appear until 1813, and it was used in an American cotton mill. A little more historical context to, for, for you here. Uh, 1878, the year that Barry was born, <coughs> Louise Pasteur inoculated chickens against cholera. Edison's patenting the, the light bulb, which affects you here in Butte for mining, because it was the way to get the safe lamp. George M. Cohen was born, fine music, and the first woman got to be a telephone operator, and Sherwin Williams sold mixed paint and cans. At the time she was born, we had 80 different time zones. In 1881, we came up with the Greenwich Mean Time and standardized time. 1884 gave us the Oxford Dictionary. 1885, the Statue of Liberty. 1888, George Eastman and the Kodak film. So some of what I'm going to talk about here was able to be photographed. 1903, Orville and Wilbur Wright took flight. 1904, Times Square became Times Square because the New York Times had built a large building there in the Long Acre Square. And in 1908, you had the Ford Model T. Summary, there was no electricity. Refrigeration was an ice box that needed to be filled daily. There was primitive plumbing, no hot water often in homes. Non-motorized transport, mostly walking horses and wagons, and many time zones. This was the world just as industrialization began. Returning to Mary Meg Atwater's story, and I've got a picture of like a Civil War guy out here, right? <laughs> Mary was born as Mary Adams Meggs, and she was the child of a military family. Montgomery C. Meggs, Mary's great-grandfather, spent the majority of his career in the Army Corps of Engineers, where he was the Quartermaster General of the Union Army during the Civil War. That's quite a position. Mary's grandfather, Montgomery was also a civil engineer in the Army Corps of Engineers, working on navigation and flood control dams on the Mississippi River. Most of Montgomery's working life was spent in the northern parts of the river near Keoka, Iowa, and Rock Island, Illinois, where Mary was born. It's clear that Mary was born into a family that valued service and education and organization. Engineering was something that Mary had a desire for. At the end of finishing school, she wrote, I had made up my mind. I was no genius at art. What I really cared about was mathematics. What I wanted to be was an electrical engineer and proposed going to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which had just decided to permit female students. A fight ensued, and if my grandmother Lindy had been alive, I might have won the battle, as she was usually on the side of revolution, except in the matter of red flannel petticoats. But she had died the year before, and I lost the fight. Mary attended the Chicago Art Institute and School of Design. But she also worked as a draftsman in, a, in the Winslow Brothers Company, a wrought iron manufacturer, and she was drawing at the academy at night. She was confronted one day by the head teacher at the School of Design after sharing with him her work at the Art Academy, and he stated, it's apparent you can draw. In fact, you can draw as well as many of the masters. What of it? What are you going to do with it? You can't just go on drawing studio nudes. It's not worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Mary writes that her inner side of this conversation came out like this. It was time to be about the business of being what I wanted to be, and what I wanted to be, I decided was a muralist. To become one, it seemed clear, I have to go back to Paris. I cashed in the part of the legacy that my mother left me and went to Paris alone this time. I was 21 and felt myself completely grown up and in charge of my own affairs. Mary writes that when I arrived at the Gare du Nord in that blustery autumn day in 1899, I was met by a delegation. Dorothy Atwater, who had been my roommate at boarding school, a tall young man who turned out to be her brother, and my faithful Harold, a friend from Chicago Art Institute days. Dorothy's father, 
a distinguished industrial chemist, was in Paris on business for his company. Max had graduated as a mine engineer. During my first weeks in Paris, I saw a good deal of Max Atwater. We went to the Louvre together and to Vespers at Notre Dame. We took little trips on the Seine, in the Bateau Mouches, forgive this pronunciation, and picnic at the Bois de Muda. There could be no more wonderful place to be young and in love, for we did fall in love. Max went back to the Liberty Bell Mine to his job as the assistant superintendent, and I stayed on for a time in Paris, but my heart was no longer in the study. Max had asked me to marry him, and I put most of my energies into getting together a <coughs> modest trousseau. I bought linen sheets, Russian linen tablecloths with the little red and blue patterns running through them, and clothes, dainty under things, hats and dresses. Clothes meant, until this time, had meant little to me, but now I was interested. About Max Atwater, and it's easy to, in our weaving history, to, to miss the other half of this, what I would call a dynamic duo. Because since being here, I learned about Max. He was born in Millville, New Jersey in 1878. He graduated from the Colorado School of Mines. He went there from 1897 to 18 to 1901. He worked at the Liberty Bell Gold Mining Company in Telluride, Colorado from 1901 to 1903. He worked at the United Elkhorn Mines, Oregon as a superintendent from 1904 to 1905. He was a junior partner at Atwater Linton and Atwater Mining Engineers in, in Montana in 1905. And he was hired by the Butte and Superior Copper Company as the general superintendent from 1909 to 1912. In 1913, he said that he did general examination and exploration work. There's a meaning behind that. In 1918, he was the president and manager of Basin Salvage Company, and he died in 1919. His father was a notable chemist in the field of scientific glassmaking. His name was Richard Mead Atwater Sr. He lived from 1844 to 1922, and what's notable about him is he put all nine of his children through college. Butte Superior was the first company in the United States to use something called froth flotation. And, okay, the weavers just say, eyes gloss over. Why does this matter? <laughs> the engineer in, in us would understand that we've done deep rock mining and we have our ore. Froth flotation implies that they are doing some grinding and some cookery and finding out how to get these chemicals or minerals, in our case, to rise to the top so that they could be brought off. In 1911, a gentleman named James M. Hyde, a former employee of Mineral Separation Limited, modified the, limit, the mineral separation process and installed a test plant in the Butte and Superior Mill in Basin, Montana, the first such installation in the United States. And in 1912, he designed the Butte and Superior Zinc Works in Butte, Montana, the first great flotation plant in America. Mineral Separation Limited, which had set up an office in San Francisco, sued Hyde and in, for infringement as well as the Butte and Superior Company, but both cases were eventually won by the firm in the U.S. Supreme Court. Mm. The man who headed this operation clearly knew what he was doing and clearly was involved. These pictures are from uh, a newspaper article, and when we get to the end of the presentation, I will hand you out the notes that include these links so that those that are trying to research further feel like they have a good uh, starting base to work with. What was interesting about this froth flotation, sounds like bubbles and it's really mm -hmm. important, with the froth flotation, is that um, <laughs> the original process used water. And there's something about the bubbles and the air and the gas coming up. Max and his team used oil instead, and it actually made much higher yields. This flotation process was used to clean up the dumps from Heinz's uh, mines, and they often called it slime. So this slide is showing. Uh, I love this. This is the cleanup. So 
This from the EPA tells me from the Superfund site it confirms for me where Max Atwater's plant was. And most people will be absolutely stunned to discover this is right next to the Mary Widow Health Mine. Hmm. And so when you go there on I-15, it's right on the side of I-15, they don't even know what they're sitting next to. Hmm. It's, it's absolutely clean, it's a health mine. It started out originally as a different kind of gold mine. But as you saw in the picture in this last slide, this flotation process required the hillside because you had to begin with ground things and then keep moving things through stages and gravity was part of the process. So I could confirm, and I actually saw in Jefferson County, the fact that uh, Max Atwater purchased this property. It was block 17, lots one and two of the basin original town site. Hmm. It was exciting the day I opened it up, looked at it. Hmm. So there is the article. There, there is information how to get to the article. <coughs> Let's return our attention to Mary's story. My fine linens and my handsome silver hardly fitted the scarred table in the dining room. I had, of course, seen shacks like this one on the edges of towns, but living in such a place had never entered my mind. The stained and torn wallpaper was hideous, and the furniture was sparse and battered. My Paris clothes looked pathetic hanging on nails behind a calico curtain in the corner of the bedroom. And my French linen sheets looked odd in the scaly iron bed with the sagging mattress. My husband thought it was funny when he came home sweeping to see me sweeping with the broom handle under my arm. How was I to know how to handle a broom? Of the art of cookery, I knew no more than I did of playing the harp, but I had a cookbook and I learned. There was no bathroom, but an outhouse at the end of a plank walk at the back. Mercifully, there was water, cold, in the kitchen sink. <coughs> These are pictures of Butte in uh, the Butte mine and the Butte and Superior mine. Mary spoke of Butte from 1909 to 1913, and her statement is, to me, Butte is important. If I cannot look out of my window and see something beautiful, I'm unhappy and feel coldness in the heart. I believe that other people are affected the same way, and they do not know the cause of their distress. I think one must have beauty to be comfortable, to be kind, to be good, and certainly to be happy. Butte is remarkably ugly. <laughs> the absurd state of politics was one of the reasons that once I gave up bridge, I decided to go for public work. I had always been interested in social service, and in Butte there seemed plenty of things that one might do. I found that by reading the legal statutes that Montana courts were empowered to appoint volunteer probation officers, so a friend of mine and I applied to Judge Donlin at the county court and were appointed. Our friend Mary was also into politics, and she was a suffragette. I think politics is the most fascinating game in the world. I had never had more fun than once as a youngster when I got myself elected secretary of a local women's club and had all the nice old ladies of the community running about from door to door campaigning for something or other. A very worthy cause, of course. It did them all a lot of good, although you could see how surprised they were to find themselves doing it. And this was long before Carrie Chapman Catt. Basin. In the years of 1906 and 1910, Basin's population had peaked at about 1,500 people. It supported numerous businesses, and I love this little list here. A hardware store, a drugstore, a bank, a bakery, three hotels, a newspaper, four boarding houses, livery stables, blacksmith, a sawmill, a bathhouse, a brewery, three grocery stores, Several brothels and 12 saloons. The town also supported several entertaining venues, included a dance pavilion, a grandstand, a baseball diamond, and a playground, as well as several organizations, a uni hall, and numerous churches. Reminds me of you today. <laughs> <laughs> the birth of the Shuttlecraft Guild. So when we talk about Mary Makes Atwater, most of us today are thinking about the book she wrote. 
and we're in a phase where we're talking about, for the book, how did this all begin? In 1916, I had heard of the hand-weaving industries of Berea, Kentucky, and in one or two other places in the South, and it had seemed to me that a similar project would meet our needs. I made some experiments with hand-weaving myself using a small table loom with what information I could glean from an article published in an industrial arts magazine. And by the way, that magazine was called Industrial Arts. Mm -hmm. Creative naming. <laughs> Convinced that weaving was interesting and practical, I purchased a loom, fitted a workshop at a small house in Basin, and sent it to California for an instructor. This instructor was a Mr. Gray. He acted as a foreman of the weaving shop and directed the work. Any woman in Basin who wished to weave was given the opportunity to learn how to weave my looms. Later, those who became proficient were paid for their work. This was the beginning of the Shuttlecraft Guild and Weaving Shop. My own work with the project was, from the first, chiefly in design. I made trips to Boston, New York, Philadelphia, searching in museums, libraries, and private collections for patterns and forgotten weaves. After a time, I wrote articles about the Shuttlecraft Workshop at Basin, and I began to publish a series of blueprinted pattern drafts for hand weavers. So the model that she built this on was Berea's College and Fireside Industries. And the connection to mining is absolutely uh, important. The, the fact that we think of Berea in Kentucky and the coal mining from there. They established a college that people could go to and it would cost like $100 a year. Now to us that seems like a very small amount of money. But many of the students who were attending that college could not afford the tuition. They allowed them to earn their way through the college by selling their weaving. So Fireside Industries promoted weaving, promoted the sale of goods. So this, this you might not be able to see it, but they paid, they advertised in ads, and they said, we can pay for well-woven linen at 40 cents a yard, jeans at 60 cents, Lindsay at 50 cents, well-matched bed coverless at $4 to $6, and patent dyes are not accepted. Patent dyes are our today's synthetic dyes. So they only wanted natural dyes. This process for Maria College had actually begun in 1900. But by 1916, when Mary was seeing this, they had a major advertising campaign throughout the United States. Mary came across it and said, oh, I'm in mind. Look at what another city has done. Would it work here? And that was the beginning of her Shuttlecraft Guild. In that process of starting the business in 1916, she was up and running by 1917. But during that process, as World War I began, Mary signed up for service. Now, she was a mother who had two children, yet she signed up for service. She entered the army by hiring a caregiver for her daughter because she was called to service in 1918 and her son was at boarding school. She recounted her first experience as an occupational therapist. She, was, she began weaving in 1916. She was hired as a professional weaver as an occupational therapist to teach weaving to soldiers. I think I'll put you on Ward 61, said the head aide. Come along. But what is I supposed to do when I got there? I asked, aghast. I had never seen the inside of a hospital ward and only had the vaguest idea of what occupational therapy might be. The service had entirely omitted the period of training promised in the enlistment advertisements. Mm -hmm. Oh, you just find something interesting for the patients to do, the head said airily. I am listed as a hand weaver, I protested. What equipment is there and what materials? She said simply, we haven't any materials or equipment yet. I suppose they'll give us something to work with after a while. At that moment, I was more completely terrified than ever before or since in my life. My knees knocked together as we walked. Empty hands, I must have something in my hands. I spied a piece of frayed old clothesline hanging from a post. I gathered it in, and at least I had something to twist between my fingers. I've often thought with thankfulness of that bit of clothesline. It nearly saved my life. With it, I was able to teach soldiers about knots and earn their trust. As an occupational therapist, she talked about a particular incident that most Montanans will enjoy. 
One day, I spread out the colors on the bed of a new patient that we wanted to make a card woven belt. He pawed among the bright colored balls of yarn, apparently not finding what he wanted. Finally, he said in a tone of outrage, haven't you got any pink? Why don't, why I don't believe I do, I dislike pink rather violently. I didn't think you would want pink. <laughs> you come from Montana, don't you, he demanded. You ought to know that every cowboy wants pink, and a lot of us here are cowboys. I added pink to my collection, but reluctantly, and it was pink and purple that the cowboys inevitably chose. <laughs> The Tough Transition Years. Max Atwater dies in June of 1919, and we can relate to that in the fact that this was part of the Spanish flu epidemic. Although he passed later than the uh, actual epidemic because he died of encephalitis, meaning it did not clear or cure. And they had taken him to uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And, it, and everything that they tried to do didn't work. Mary, after Max dies, returns to her army post and she works as an occupational therapist. She eventually returns to base in Montana and ultimately settled in Seattle, which is connected to the University of Washington. In 1921, she teaches weaving at the University of Washington and she prepares a correspondence course in hand weaving. The course was tested at the university and in the summer of 1922, Mary moved back to base in Montana. In 1923, she moved to Boston to be near her son, who she was sending to Harvard. The course that Mary developed, and you cannot read any of these words, I'm all about it, but look for my outline, it's good. The teaching of weaving. She developed this course, and in the course, she, she wrote up a little paragraph it says, I was uncertain at first whether or not weaving could be successfully taught by the means of written instructions and diagrams. But through the kindness of the Home Economics Department of the University of Washington, I was able to test my course before offering it to the public. A group of students who knew nothing of weaving were given a loom in my notes for the first lessons. Without other instruction, they produced creditable work, and one of their number even demonstrated weaving for a week in one of the downtown department stores. My students now number many, and in all parts of the country, the excellence of the work sent in to me for criticism makes it possible for me to say with assurance that weaving by mail is a success. The course in weaving on a loom is designed to cover a period of six months. The work could be accomplished in less time. An additional time may be arranged when necessary. The course was in three sections, and it comprised itself of eight lessons. On the table here are some mimeographs from that course. And so it was published and distributed uh, by an Anaconda publisher. She mailed it out. And it was so important to realize that this was distance education. She started this process with a hundred people and she convinced them to pay five dollars for the year. In the dollars of 1922, when the average woman was earning under a thousand dollars, she quickly had two months, she doubled, three months, and, and this was just going crazy. So she had come across a business prospect that worked well. One, she had the acumen to teach it and to, to test it. The second was the country was hungry for this information. There were no weaving magazines. It was hard to find information. How Mary presented her research is important. The pictures you see on the left here are samples or photographs. What I have on the table is the actual diagrams that people got to work with. There was no formal way of notating weaving drafts at the time. Anybody who's seen colonial weaving uh, drafts will see something that looks like uh, funny music with numbers. It's the best way I, I could call it. It's got a set of staff of lines, it's got numbers, and unless you were a weaver who had some training, it would be a little difficult for you to figure out what you were looking at. Mary, with her ability to do uh, technical drawing, was able to combine the art and the math portion of weaving. 
So in her book, she was showing that she was creating these drafts. She would release them on a subscription basis because she had to subscribe to the guild. Again, she was creating a, a, a method of generating constant revenue and not worried about cyclic things. Shows that she had a really good concept of business as a structure. In 1925, Mary published privately and through subscriptions from the Shuttlecraft Guild members, a book of patterns for hand weaving. Her first book was uh, based on John Landis's designs. I'm running away from the camera. <laughs> oh, no! This little book. So she did this in three parts of a subscription. And when she went out looking for parts, and when she wanted people to back her, she said, send me $5 and I'll send you three copies. You can sell two of these and keep one for yourself. And that's how this was published. So she convinced the people in the Pennsylvania Museum to allow her access to documents that were from the 1700s from Weaver's draft books. And she, they didn't have any instruction, by the way. These draft books are Quite mysterious. Uh, if you're a weaver, we now know them as profile drafts. But there was a way of them recording things, and they would be able to keep their weaving secrets secret, but be able to show patterns to customers. So this was amongst the books. And when she did this book and released it, it was successful. She also, in her business plan, again, cannot read. The Guild Bulletin sold materials at a discount. So this will bring you to some of my collection here. She offered a 10% discount on regular prices. If you ordered this and marked the envelope in a certain way, and you received it by the 15th of the month, and then you know this is where you get the discount. If you don't do all the things that she has in her list, I get to sell it to you full price. <laughs> She used serial publication under the production of her books, and that was not unheard of. A gentleman named Luther Hooper in England had used a similar business model a little bit earlier about his books. He had a five volume set. So this was not uh, totally unheard of, but the strength and response and the support that they provided to her was that uh, she was earning a good living. <laughs> She wasn't rich, but she earned a good living. So what she did, she wrote up and she said, my great ambition is to put into permanent form for all the interesting data on the American weaving and the hundreds of patterns I've collected. As we all know, American weaving is a, a present, a very, has very present meager literature. Nothing at all complete has ever been published. The story of the early weavers hidden in dusty archives and obscure collections in attics and in old letters it's a story that I would sure everyone find interesting. For instance, we would like to know more of John Landis, who made the wonderful book of drawings now in the Pennsylvania Museum, more than simply that he was an artist and he lived and worked at about the time of Washington. I want to dig among the records of the period until I can reconstruct him, and I can show you him as he traveled the lonely roads of that day from one primitive settlement to another with his looms, his reels and swifts, his shuttles and whatnot, and a creak, on a creaking ox cart with his precious pattern book carefully stowed away from the weather to be brought out for inspection by the capable housewife whose beautifully spun and dyed yarns he had been engaged to win to weave. That started an outpouring. The American women who had these patterns heard of her interest, and when they did that, she started to receive in the mail hundreds of patterns and books. And her response to that was to begin work on publishing something she called a recipe book. This book, again, was published serially. It, it, it was published early. And it truly began my life as a weaver. There's this pattern over here that we call Recipe 19, and it's my claim to fame because um, I can prove it's never been woven by anybody. <laughs> Because even in her technical draft, it was wrong. These patterns 
were submitted by other people who wove, or she went to a museum, she found them, she collected them, and she released this to her weaving public. Okay, you didn't know I wove it. I truly <laughs> wove it. <laughs> this is a story of me as a weaver and how I intersect with Mary. This pattern, I came to Montana in 1991, and I started out in West Yellowstone. And West Yellowstone, we all know, has a nine-month winter. It's really good at that. And I needed something to do, so I was in a wheelchair at the time, and so I picked up an eight-shack loom. I came across this pattern, and I said, oh, I want to do this. The technique, for those that don't weave, this is called double weave. Thin weave, to be specific, it's a pickup technique. It means that I have to look at every line and do something to make this pattern appear. This pattern is not the full recipe pattern. And so I went to somebody and said, well, why is that not the full recipe pattern? Why can't I do that? That's part of you know learning how to weave. So I met up with uh, Jim Ahrens of ABL, and he told me, my ABL loom can weave this. He lied. It can only weave part of it. It can only weave center part of this. Hmm. No, this is not overshot. This is summer and winter. It's a different structure. If you're not a weaver, you don't know. You don't care. <laughs> but I wasn't satisfied with this. I like the border. I like the edges, the fanciness of all of this. Then I met up with a nice young lady that we all probably know who, who are from this area, a lady named Joanne Hall. And she said, I have a loom you could weave it on. And this is my very first attempt with this on the draw loom. Turns out when you finally do this, it requires a 100 shaft draw loom to weave it. So Mary is telling you about a pattern that she found in a museum. And all she knew of the pattern was, like I did, it's beautiful. <laughs> what it was, how it was woven, how it got there, she never had the ability to know. So this book, although it was a brilliant start, really didn't tell the story of what we've been doing for the last hundred years as weavers, which is in many cases unraveling these things and trying to figure out where did they come from. What are they about? Mary, when she did her work, also published in the modern Priscilla magazine. And to see this in a fancy magazine format looks so different from what you're seeing on, on, the, on the mimeograph pieces. So taking from her talent, it's the same drafts, it's the same ideas, but how she thought about it. This frock she's talking about here, she's spiriting Chanel and the development of the designers of the times. And so that's why it played so well. Something else I was able to find is Mary's hand on her warranty deed. And what was most amusing about it is she paid $400, she bought a patent claim. She's a smart woman, she knew what business she was in, she bought a part of a patent claim for $400, and she says in her deed here, lawfully, lawful money, meaning I earned it, this is my money, it's for real. And I thought that that was a really interesting character trait of Mary to, to be able to, to say that, that she bought it. This property that she bought is part of what we know today as Basin Creek Ranch. So, um, I think it was called that. I, yeah, it's the Basin Creek Ranch near Basin. Um, Mary did other things too, and I'm not going to get into a whole lot of depth about how much more wide her experience is, because she was truly a uh, character, Montana character. There was this bulletin published by the federal government, and it uh, talks about weaver habitats, beaver control, and possibilities of beaver farming. And trust me, Mary and her son 
fell for it, <laughs> hook, line, and sinker. So she went out, they rented land, they bought some land. She comes back to Butte after seven nights on the train, and she says it's too much to take it in one dose, according to Mary. She was 50 years old when making this trip back to Butte, but it's wonderful to be here. The streams are full of water, and the fishing has begun. It's warm, almost hot, and there's very little snow to be seen. Only a tiny wisp along the crest of Pole Mountain, she wrote at her arrival on May 22nd. She recounted a beaver ranching story. The first of the beaver had arrived that week and had been placed on the Piola branch. One of the small ones was pretty far gone, but revived on having water thrown at it. It was hard to get the beasts out to the ranch as the road was underwater, and they had to pack the crates between them. Tom, a local man who was working for us that summer, had built a handsome pen with a shelter and a piece of creek to play in. They appeared contented, but quite promptly got out and vanished. So that's that. Monty said as he left Tom, devising a box trap to catch them again. Mary continued to live in, the ba in Basin while working on her business at the Shuttlecraft Guild at his bulletin. The Great Depression, May of 1931, she published the recipe book. 1931, the Great Depression hits. 1932, her daughter Ben graduated from high school. 1935, she wrote a mystery book, Crime and Corn Weather, while she was a resident of Bozeman, and her daughter was attending MSU Bozeman. 1937, she attended the first weaving conferences and institutes on which weavers could gather for education and exchange of information. She began traveling for her weaving expertise. She said of Montana during the Depression, of course there is much desperate poverty this winter, but it's probably not as bad here as in the cities. People can at least keep warm and there's plenty of fuel, free for the taking, and food is cheaper here than in the East. The people who have to be taken care of are the transients who drift in without warm clothes or money. In 1932, Mary wrote to her sister, I'm working my head off at this weaving business of mine, but making a living at it, and in these times, that's something. In the old times, people who wished beautiful fabrics to wear and to use in their homes made these things for themselves on the household loom, and now again, those of us who are weavers are finding in the far-famed depression need not to keep us from being handsomely dressed or from having new draperies, rugs, linens that lend so much to the grace of living. What for us was many, for us, an interesting accomplishment, a pleasant occupation for spare time, has very much become a practical help in the present emergency. Mary was a patriot, she said of herself. The war years ended with Mary thoroughly involved in weaving institutes and becoming more and more an authority and a character. Eventually, Mary moved to Salt Lake City area to be with her daughter and passed away in 1956, leaving a wonderful legacy to weavers all over the world. I want to leave a discussion of Mary's life with a powerful and timeless quote from her writing. We are two handy creatures, and the close connections between hands, heart, and mind are a part of our being. The age of machinery greatly impoverished our lives through depriving our hands of so much of the work that for time immemorial have been their function. The great modern revival of handicraft is a wholesome thing, making for peace, comfort, and pleasant living, even if nobody made a yard of handwoven fabric for sale. So we're going to talk a little bit about what's around the room, and then I'm going to let you have a few questions. The little portion of story I gave you today was really to give you an idea of who Mary was in the context of where we are and where we live. I brought over a number of her books, so she is fairly well published, and today the book that she's most known for, I'm coming back. <laughs> I gotta run away. <laughs> is, this is her book. It has been through more than 20 editions. It has been in continuous publication since 1922. Hundred years ago, it is still in publication today through a company called HTH Publishing, and um, 
although I'm trying to get to HTH, I think it has something to do with Harriet Tidwell, who had bought the Shuttlecraft Guild and all of its documents afterwards. This is the book that every weaver goes to when they're learning how to weave. I would say almost all of the weavers in the room have heard of the book, know that it's out there, hear people on the internet go, go look at the Mary Mae Tadwater book. <laughs> when they say her book, this is the book. But this recipe book, most of her documents when she went to Salt Lake City, there is a guild in Salt Lake City that's called Mary Meg's Atwater Guild. And the reason it's called that is while she lived there, they chose to take her guild bulletins and her documents afterwards, and they have all of the bulletins on file so that you could actually see them and read them and work through them. But the purpose of that guild is to keep her alive in Salt Lake City, Utah. Hence, I'm coming back to the part that says, Montana, don't you know you are, know your own? <laughs> Why do we not have something to tell us about this woman? Um, on the table, I have weaving samples that I have done from her lesson number two. Her first lesson, by the way, involved, that's a loom. <laughs> okay. And so her second lesson was to, to put this pattern together, and this pattern has a name to us weavers as honeysuckle. And it looks like a Montana honeysuckle. It's unique in the fact that the Montana, Montana honeysuckle really has four leaves. It's important to know that many, many things can be woven out of this. But when she did her, her lesson, she had three problems with this one lesson. So you had this eight and a half, well, it's a little bigger. It looks like 11 by 17 to me. She in favor. And she gave me three problems. To weave a square in the pattern as drawn in. You had to know what that was to do it. To weave a towel or a table runner in plain weave with colored borders. <coughs> and to weave a sampler. And this pattern is capable of many variations. Do not try to produce a piece of weaving for use in any way. So I spent a summer trying to do this thing. <laughs> And I came up with this little piece. This little piece is called Morning Maps. I did it as a tribute to 100 years since his death. This is based on, honey wheels, uh, on the honeysuckle pattern. And for those of you in the Helena Weaver's Guild, ha, 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 there is a game and a challenge based on this information. <laughs> so there will be more to come. Uh, you're free to touch and look at it, but each of these patterns was generated with a single threading on the loom, so I did not need to change that. I changed something we call treadling, how I picked up the shafts to create all these cool patterns. <laughs> so hundreds could be done, and today when we copy overshot patterns today, and we see all of these old things, Mary really wanted us to understand that although we had seen the original geometric designs, every design in Overshot was capable of doing this. And we as weavers miss that. Totally miss the idea that we can design on the loom. This large loom over here is a Structo 705. So you know how basketball players wear Nikes? Mary was smart. The Structo company, which was really a toy company, actually manufactured looms to a specification. And they did some really cool things with it. This loom, because it is actually in black and not battleship gray, shows that it was dated in, in pre-World War II. Because the manufacturer of the metal in black, they had black paint. After the war, almost everything right after the war was done in gray for a long time. This loom had various models, but this is, Mary would put her uh, pattern together so that she, you could use this loom in particular. And it was really neat because it was all modular design. This could be a four shaft loom or an eight shaft loom. It had a really neat brake system from the front. And the most other unique thing that the structure company did is they used these spools. So instead of you having to wind your warp, they could sell you pre-wound warp through the guild and make more money on the supplies. 
So there was a hex beam here that these spools fit on. But you could also set it up as a traditional room. So that's what this was. This item here is a tablet loom. Uh, she had connections to the Lily Mills Company, and they made her weaving cards for tablet weaving. So when she did her book, Byways in Hand Weaving, she had her own cards to sell, her own materials to sell. The woman was a businesswoman. She put her son through Harvard. She did many things to make the world around her a better place. Her children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren have used her documentation and memoirs to even do PhDs. Yes, Montana does not acknowledge this woman as being a woman who was of note in our history. So that is the point of my conversation. Is it time for us to think about where does the sign go? Where does the display go? How do we help keep this story alive? Because she was tied to mining. She lived here in Butte. She lived in Basin. She lived in Montana and always considered Montana her home. Thank you. in the folk directories for granted. I've been poking around looking to see if the home or the house actually exists, and I don't think that it does. <coughs> I believe that it's in that 600 block area. Is it so, East, East Park? Yeah, I, I, oh. I, I don't have a specific address in my head mm -hmm. in the present moment. But that block now is industrial mm -hmm. in, in some of its uh, nature. But there were homes, and it looks like to me, as the wife of the superintendent, although the mining uh, museum has a superintendent's house, when you were dealing with Butte and Superior, they were expected to live in the uptown. And if you look in the archives in the papers, often she was in the society pages. When she went to the Homer Club, or she hosted a luncheon, or she left it at all, she was very much a public figure in those days. East Park would have been the Bins. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if she's in, yeah, influence if she did live there like the Weavers. And, and I don't know, from her <laughs> recollection, she says she did not touch weaving until 1916. And it was something she just saw. Um, in her family's life, I would imagine that she would have seen it. She went to a finishing school. And there is a little theory of some research I'm doing. My great aunt Harriet was a historian out of New York City and got her PhD in the Depression years, but she was around the same age as Mary Max Outwater. My theory is when these occupational therapists got together through the, the government putting them in, into the war effort, it started to bring them together and they may have had a reason to interact with one another. These women of 1918 are incredible women women to to the woman and I and I have to say that I the stories I'm seeing coming out of this are just magnificent. And she did travel because the railroad was easy. She loved to go from here, New York City, Boston, she could get down as far as Washington, Philadelphia, because they all have good chain connections. This might be for Kim. Do do we have any moments? In an archive collection? Do we have any what? Wovens? <clears throat> um, we don't like to take textiles, <laughs> but sometimes we do if they're given to us. So um, I'm not sure if we do or not, or if the mining museum does. The mining museum has a textile collection, mm -hmm. and I've taken a little bit of a look at it, tiny little glimmer. Yeah. Most of it is commercial. Yeah. There has been no, if in all the love of history that we have here, there has been no formal study of the textiles that have come in and the stories around them. Many of the items we have were commercial, but the story even of their design and how they managed to get here is significant because it, it's part of who Butte is. 
um, because you could have come from anywhere, but if you actually were doing well in the mines, I've got to say, Butte women love their hats. <laughs> they always love their finery, and it's part of who we are. Yeah, and I wonder if Kathy Carlson might have a collection of uh, because her family is Finnish, so she might have a personal collection of the Finnish weaving. Well, <clears throat> too, maybe. <laughs> it would be cool to have a display. Yeah, yeah, we did um, during our, yeah, during the Finnish, yeah. With, <clears throat> yeah. That book, the recipe book, is selling on uh, Amazon for 180 bucks. Well, the original copy. I have no problem. It is currently in production. It is available to weavers electronically on a CD. The updated version of what this guild did was we all wove one recipe out of it so that you could actually have physical copies you know, that we could see that it was produced. So mine was the contribution for recipe 19 because I was absolutely certain that nobody had woven that little thing. So uh, yes, it's available. Many of the documents I have here throughout this HTH publications have been re-releasing these things, although you would think copyright would have been expired, but the copyrights were extended in 86, and so they're still valid and under copyright. I know the historical, Montana Historical Society has a loom. Do you know any information on that now that I know this information? I know some information about the loom that they have. And what's displayed on it today is a buffalo check plaque. I had the opportunity to go pre-COVID up to the historic uh, society, and I ran across one textile that is not marked as being hand-woven. And I spent the time during COVID learning how that textile was constructed and have been weaving a reproduction of it. It was a reticule, a bag, that was used most likely to hold opera glasses to go to the Helena Opera. Hmm. Its original materials were silk, uh, probably even hand spun silk, but I could prove by reconstructing it, it was done on a four shaft loom. And if it was done on a four shaft loom, it was possible that the actual person who contributed may have woven it. It wasn't a commercial product. So could we find these things that are masquerading as a commercial product? Yes. Do we know to look for them? Probably the answer is no. Hmm. Everybody knows about overshot coverlets and double view coverlets, but they don't recognize all these other little things that might have been in our homes. The, the big loan that's at the Historical Society a couple of years ago, the Helena Weaver's Guild, worked on it to get it working, and we put a new work on it and people what's on that gift. Yeah, there's a buffalo check plaid in green and white, from what I saw. And Joanne said, mm -hmm. said you know, organized it and said, yes, Joanne home. But it is also that these looms would have been also <coughs> used for smaller objects as well. And this was a very good example of something that would have been woven in the time. Do you know anything about her cabin in bowl in? My understanding is, when I went to Basin, and I did go camping at the Mary yeah. Widow Mine, by the way. <laughs> I, love, I love going camping there. It's got a good RV uh -huh. park. Um, the property that I saw for 36 courts, which I think would have been the first small house, the original house is gone. It has been uh, replaced by a more modern house. Uh, so the thought of, could we get to her house? I don't think we can. I think the closest that you would be able to get to is the school, because she was often connected to the school. What you might not be aware of is the Beale family, which is a name that people may know now for Bozeman and Ennis, etc., is our descendants of Mary Meg's Outwater. Huh. Um, and through the fifth generation, they're, they're trying to keep the history alive. But I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that this is family, so if they're sitting there saying, should you put a you know, plaque up for my great-grandma? Probably not. I think the, the words that I'm saying today have to come from someone else who experiences the value of what this woman brought and say, perhaps it's time for us to consider it. Where it's going to go, I don't know. I have no stake in, in, in any of that. I just know 
that something that is precious to us has been pulled in other places. It's being kept for historical purposes, but it's not in its home. Well, I've kept you all to like 10 after, so it must have been an awesome conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, but it was 
then Yeah, 